right, so thank you everyone for joining. We are just about at the top of the hour. Um, we have a couple minutes. Uh, we'll wait for other attendees to get in. Uh, but before we get started, we wanted to let everyone in, uh, let you know we're all here and ready to go. Uh, my name is Mark. I'm joining me, Sharon and Phil from Polygon Advisor Group, and we'll do some bigger introductions when we get into the content. But wanted to thank you all for joining. And we will get started very, very shortly. And real quick, uh, Phil and Sharon, where are you guys all based at right now? We're in uh, Northern Virginia. Near Washington, DC. Uh, we actually used to work for the same company here. So that's how we got to know each other. Very cool. Uh, the Beltway, you guys are close in it. Hopefully you guys can go out there and be some, a disciplined voice for an otherwise chaotic uh, industry so far when it comes to that area. We'll see. I wouldn't. I wouldn't hold my breath. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, loss of traffic jams here. Oh, I remember. Uh, I was in New Jersey uh, for most of my career prior to moving to Austin, Texas. So I. Had, it was just. It's really interesting being in Central Jersey, so Princeton, New Jersey. You know, forty minutes away from Philly, few hours, well, less than a few hours away from DC, and uh other areas and then new york is very close it's, it was really interesting the book of business that i had every everyone was a little all over the place but i see we've got a few more joining so thank you for joining we are actually at the top of the hour i'm going to give just a quick 30 second buffer for those chiming in i know it's it's at different times for everyone joining we have people signed up all the way from alaska all the way to the East Coast in Boston. So I'm excited that we're getting people in all different time zones. Uh, but to be respectful of time, we're gonna try to keep things on schedule um, and as impactful as possible. So with that, we are about 30 seconds past the hour. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and get this presentation started. Again, thank you all for joining. And Sharon, Phil, I'm gonna use you as just to kind of give me the thumbs up that I've got the, the presentation up. All righty. So let's go ahead and do this. Uh, so everyone, welcome to the webinar today. We are talking about crypto taxes. Uh, my name is Mark Nichols. Uh, I am the product director at Arbor Digital. And with me today, I am being joined by a couple of esteemed guests from Polygon Advisory. But just like any financial webinar, before we get into the broader intros, uh, we have to go over some disclosures. And the first disclosure is from us over at Arbor, which is we are financial advisors, but we are not your financial advisor. This webinar is for education purposes only, and you cannot take any representation of this data and make it uh, depend on any future results. Uh, so no guarantee, no guarantee of anything we talk about will be moving forward into the future. This is a statement of kind of the now. Um, and then with Polygon Advisory Group, this presentation is the same thing for educational purposes only. Uh, it is general in nature and based on uh, authorities that are subject to change, and it's not intended to provide and should not be relied upon for any investment, tax, legal, or accounting advice. If you need advice, you should consult an advisor on the side so we can take some and we'll have a call to action slide at the end there. But I think I got my time. It's got to stay up there for as long as it can, and we've got it up there so we can now move forward to the next one. And that's it. Just a little bit about Arbor Digital and Polygon Advisory Group. Uh, so Arbor Digital is a full ser service wealth management offer for investment advisors and independent advisors uh, in the U.S. to offer crypto to their clients and meet their fiduciary duty. Um, we like to be the bridge and that connection uh, for traditional financial advisors to this new and emerging asset class and landscape um, for them. And uh, Sharon or Phil, I didn't know if you wanted to take just two minutes just to say who Polygon is. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, so Polygon Advisory Group, uh, we are a CPA firm, public accounting firm. We specialize in providing crypto tax and accounting services to individuals as well as businesses. Um, so uh, we are one of the top uh, CPA firms in the US specializing in crypto. And uh, <clears throat> we also do a lot of uh, tax planning and strategies um, for people in the crypto industry. Perfect. Thank you. And with that, I will go into who you are. And so today I have joining me to be delivering the intelligence for today's content 
which will be Sharon Yip, who is a licensed CPA and the co-founder and acting CEO of Polygon Advisor Group. And then Philip Gadiano, who is also a licensed CPA and is also a co-founder and acting CFO of Polygon Advisor Group. Sharon, I'd like to invite you to the stage real quick to share anything else that I missed with your intro. Uh, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> I'm so sorry for this. Um, I just got out of sickness uh, recently. So other than being a CPA with more than 20 years experience in tax, both in public accounting and corporate, uh, I'm also personally a crypto investor, as well as a certified cryptocurrency expert. Uh, so uh, I'm very happy to be uh, in this uh, webinar. Thank you, Sharon. And Phil? Yeah, kind of in the same boat as Sharon here. Um, I'm a CPA. I've been practicing for about 12 years uh, now. Um, I'm also an avid crypto investor. Um, I buy and trade uh, regularly. I participate in several DeFi protocols. Uh, and in addition, uh, from the Blockchain Council, I'm a certified cryptocurrency expert and a certified blockchain expert. Um, and Sharon likes to tell the story that uh, four or five years ago when she was starting out her crypto accounting firm, I laughed at her because I told her that crypto wasn't going to go anywhere and she was going to be out of a job in, in six months. Um, but here we are today, you know, several years later uh, together and, uh, you know, trying to, to plow this path together forward. Yeah, very client centric, a lot of value added for people in this space. Um, I'm very excited to dive even deeper into that story and to our content today. So Sharon, Bill, Great to have you and thank you for joining me today. So now that we've gone through the intros, I'd like to go through the quickly the agenda. And for all of you who are attending, the ways you can interact with us during this, because we want to make this about you as much as it is about delivering some intelligence in the crypto tax space. So the first thing I'd like to say is that there are two ways you can engage with us. One is through the chat function. Uh, you can communicate chatting with us, myself, Mark, and Phil and Sharon. Um, you cannot interact with each other, unfortunately. Um, the other way you can interact with us is asking specific questions. I know we're about to dive into a lot of things that may be very nuanced. So if there are specific questions you need to get off your chest or that are top of mind, please communicate with us through those channels, either the chat or the Q&A, and we will do our best to keep this as free-flowing as possible. And the goal of this time is not only to deliver some intelligence to you, the audience, but also to answer those burning questions. So with that, the agenda for today is we've already satisfied the first, and now that what we're gonna dive into for the next 15 to 20 minutes are the next three bullet points, which is the first are specific tax provisions to be mindful of if you're going to either be a user or an investor in this space. The second is gonna be common tax strategies you've seen in the traditional world, or if you've been in the traditional investing or uh, financial world, these are common things that are there. And now what does that mean in this space? So wash out rules, deducting losses, or engaging with crypto investing in IRAs or individual retirement accounts. And then the really exciting part is the last one, which is the crypto tax pitfalls. Given that we have spent, uh, us at Arbor and both with Polygon, the combined experience over the last three to five years, actively adding value to investors and users in the crypto space, we've compiled a few of the biggest pitfalls that we want to communicate that everyone should be aware of by the end of this um, webinar. And then we wanna spend the last 20 minutes answering your questions if we have them. And if not, we have a bunch of questions that we get every day at our firms that we will gladly answer just uh, in totality. So with that, I'd like to move forward into our next stage of the agenda, which is just a quick highlight of what we mean and kind of surface level, because I know language is a big barrier in this space. So we'd like to level set before we start diving into a lot of those pieces is just highlighting what we mean when we say certain things. And the biggest thing is really just identifying the different types of crypto tax clients or the ways you can do that. So we've got this simple rubric. And after I go through this, Phil and Sharon, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how Polygon approached this or how they implement something like this today. But the first one is your simple investor. And that's using a centralized exchange. So what is a centralized exchange? And the most popular one with over 110 million active accounts today is Coinbase. Gemini is also another example of this. So if you're a simple investor and you just buy and sell your crypto through there, that's one type of client. Then we move further along the spectrum here, which is you have a combination of using uh, investing through a centralized exchange and then going into the crypto world, which is a decentralized exchange. So those are the simpler investors that we've seen. But then once you get into the 
further along the spectrum, we get into the users. You're not just investing, you are engaging and actively building in the space. So you could be a simple user running a node, staking, or participating in DeFi protocols through governance. It could be something as simple as those things, but then you're also a multi-blockchain investor. So you're not just investing on Ethereum or Bitcoin, but you're investing in many different uh, blockchains. The last one is your crypto power users that are native. And those are both users and investors. So meaning you are heavy into it. Maybe even your entire net worth and your entire life is spent in this space, both as a user and an investor. So we like to level set there, but Phil, Sharon, do you guys think about this in a similar way? How do you help clients first just get a sense of what type of person they are when they're engaging with the, with the crypto landscape? Uh, Phil, you want to talk about this or you want me to talk uh, yeah, about Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, we, we use kind of a similar rubric. First of all, I think this is a great uh, way to break it down. Um, but this is all part of our discovery process when we onboard a new client. Uh, we like to see what their involvement is in the crypto space because there is a lot of variation between sort of the um, the, the more traditional users who who uh, interact only with centralized exchanges or maybe they have a hardware wallet or something like that uh, versus the people who live almost entirely on chain, uh, which you know encompasses a, a, at least a few of our clients. Um, and there is a, a wide range of um, experiences in there, and they kind of inform how we treat those clients. Uh, you know, we could use different language to talk to the the simpler crypto investors than we would to talk to the the more native users and things like that. But it's very important um, for us to get uh, that level of understanding up front as as far as what our clients are doing and how we should um, interact with them. Great. I love that. And so now that we've level set on the language and we level set on the different types of clients, now let's get into the meat of the meat of the. Uh, presentation here. So the first place we're going to start are the tax provisions. And I know, Phil, you're going to spend some time here taking us through these, but first start very high level, and then we'll go further deeper into each provision. Okay, sure. Yeah. So we're going to talk about a few things today. Um, the, the first thing that you need to be aware of is basically how to report crypto trades. Um, and most of that's going to happen on Schedule D, Forms 8949. Um, there are rules in place now where exchanges are going to have to furnish information on a 1099 series form, um, which if you're familiar with investing outside of crypto at traditional brokerages, buying stocks and bonds and things like that, you'll know the 1099B is the form where uh, all of your basis information, your proceeds information, sale dates, holding periods, and things like that are all reported. Um, the, the IRS is in the process now of developing a form that's crypto specific, but contains essentially the same information. Um, and that's scheduled to be produced starting this tax year, starting 2023. So you should start to see those forms roll out in early 2024. Um, it was supposed to be last year. We were supposed to start seeing them now. Then the IRS kind of pushed it uh, down the road a little bit further. But still, we see some exchanges complying or attempting to go ahead and comply uh, with, you know, it, it's been hit or miss so far in terms of what's being reported versus what should be reported. Um, like I said, the IRS is uh, going to issue a form uh, probably called the 1099-DA, DA meaning digital assets. They produced a draft of this form a couple months ago, and then quickly scrubbed it from their website. They, they pulled it right down when they opened it up for comment. They realized they had some more work to do. But it's going to be, at the end of the day, very similar to a traditional 1099-B type form. It might even be a, a bona fide 1099B, as was the language in the infrastructure bill. Uh, but it, it remains to be seen where all this will land. But the bottom line is, starting this tax year, next January and February, uh, you're going to start to see exchanges furnish um, detailed reporting on crypto transactions. There's going to be a lot of headaches associated with this because anyone who's in the crypto space knows the adage, not your keys, not your coins. Everybody's big on hardware wallets. Self-custody is the name of the game. And that's all well and good, except from a tax perspective, self-custody means that exchanges might not know your basis. They might not know what you paid for an asset when you initially purchased it. And there's no real good way to get that information onto a lot of exchanges because up until now, they haven't really cared. Uh, so we might see a, a couple things. One is that we're going to see some incomplete 1099s. 
because the exchanges aren't going to know basis information. Two is that we might see some of the bigger centralized exchanges. I know Coinbase and Kraken have talked about this, adding a feature where you can actually go in and add your cost basis. But that's kind of a can of worms as well, because there's you know tons of different assets get pooled together. You'll need to break out uh, which, which uh, inventory method you want to use in terms of valuing those and carrying over your basis and things like that. So this isn't really the uh, the silver bullet that everybody was looking for. It's it's a step in the right direction, I think, but still a lot of work to be done. Um, and finally, just just to touch on um, kind of the the overall theme of what we're talking about here is that uh, you know all trades are have to be reported. That's the rule now. It's not going to change, and it holds for crypto to crypto and crypto to fiat trades. So those eventually will come through on some type of 1099 series form. So to surmise on this first bullet point on tax revisions, Phil, it sounds like we were going to get some requirements from for these exchanges that the IRS was going to, to oppose on them, but that was punted now to this upcoming year for the 20 for our current year, 2023. So for now, still for those investing in the space, it still is not required. And anything that they do produce will either be uh, bare bones or something that the investors themselves will have to get to themselves, yeah, whether that be downloading transaction correct, yeah. reports or CSVs, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's that's correct. And and we've seen that, you know, in, in the past for, for a while, you know, uh, Celsius and, and some some other, not necessarily exchanges, but some, some sort of brokerages uh, would produce 1099 miscellaneous forms. Some even did 1099 interest forms and things like that. So, Throughout the last three or four years, certain exchanges have been attempting to kind of comply with what they thought the regulations might be. But mm. with the infrastructure bill uh, passing, we have clear guidance now that that eventually this 1099B type form is going to be required. So that's what they're all gearing up for now to be able to provide that to investors and customers. Perfect. And I will take this as a moment to uh, Bill to highlight what you mentioned with the, the 1099. Uh, miscellaneous or interest is that if you did have an account at Celsius or any of the lenders where you deposited crypto on a centralized place and they were offering you a yield or a type of APR on that crypto. So Celsius was a very popular one. I think BlockFi was a major one. Gemini Earn is also an example. Those are usually when those 1099 uh, miscellaneouses are, were being generated. So if you do, first action item here, if you do have any accounts there and you're not sure what to do, that's the first place you're going to probably want to look to make sure that you're staying in compliance. Uh, but this is a great time. We actually got a question from one of the guests, Tim Bauer, who's a friend of us and uh, full disclosure is a client of Arbor Digital, is asking, are there any official custodian tax forms generated from Gemini or other custodians, or are we just tasked with providing account history to our CPA? Um, so I think we actually answered that question, and we kind of are at this juncture. We do have to take the info and do that for you. And Tim, for clients like yourself who are part of our platform, we actually do that for you and send you those forms and send you those, those history and those transactions. So it's part of the value you get from being clients with us. Now, usually there's a time frame very much prior to uh, the tax deadline that we will send those out to you. Um, but Phil, did I miss anything? Phil, Sharon, did I miss anything there? Uh, is that kind of accurate uh, until next year? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, th there's there's been some exchanges that have been reporting on, on various 1099 forms, but it's it's hit or miss. Some of them apply thresholds over ten thousand dollars, over a hundred thousand dollars, things like that. There's really no good guideline for uh, you know if if you're a customer of a certain exchange, whether or not you should expect to get a, a tax form in the mail. It's just you know check your email and and see if see if you get one. Otherwise, you're left to your own devices to try to figure this out. Thanks, Phil. So let's move on to the next stage, which is staking, mining, and other income producing activities moving along that spectrum. So take us through this slide, Phil. Yeah, sure. So so there's there's a lot of questions that we get on on staking. Um, staking, you know, just in general, is the process of of locking up crypto right, in a consensus protocol um, and validate transactions on whatever network, whatever blockchain that you're on. Um, and in exchange for that, uh, you're rewarded with uh, native tokens, native coin. Um, and so there are a number of ways to participate in staking. Most people participate as purely kind of passive investors. Um, in that case, staking is kind of akin to like a de facto interest payment, like you'd get on your money in a savings account 
or in a bond fund or something like that. You just get uh, you know a little bit of extra money each month or each week or, or however often the, the contract pays out. Um, there's a lot of questions around whether or not the rewards are taxable um, when, they, when they're earned. And the answer is yes, unequivocally, yes, they are. Um, there was a court case earlier, it was actually last year, uh, the Jarrett case, which was out of Tennessee. Um, it was a couple who had been staking uh, Tezos, XTZ. Uh, they reported the staking income, they paid the tax on it, and then they sued the IRS and district court for a refund of that, claiming that the staking income shouldn't have been taxable because they use what, what's known now in the industry as the farming defense. Uh, basically, that staking, the act of staking, um, produces new assets akin to a farmer growing crops or an artist uh, painting a, a picture or something like that. Um, the IRS attempted to settle uh, just because the case wasn't really worth pursuing. Um, when the IRS did that, of course, social media went, you know, went, went ablaze with talks of staking's not taxable. You don't have to report anything. It was, it was a big thing. Um, but Basically, a couple of things to take away from the case. One is that it was in district court, so it wouldn't have set a precedent anyway at the national level. Um, the IRS does this all the time with cases that aren't worth it fighting. Uh, the amount in question here, I think, was $3,200. And so, as you can imagine, the IRS is much like more likely to offer a refund of $3,200 than they are to send a team of lawyers to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, or Nashville, Tennessee, wherever this was, and stay there for you know a month to fight a district court case or whatever it, it may be. Um, so they were just trying to get rid of it. Um, but what the IRS is, is going to try to do probably is wait until uh, a, there's a bigger fish essentially, wait until there's somebody who has a lot of staking income that they're not claiming that they can prove and then move that through tax court because that's how we get precedential opinions that apply at the national level to you know, everybody under the umbrella of the IRS. So although it, it seemed like there might've been some good news at the time, the Jarrett case was a whole lot of huff uh, for, for nothing. Um, with staking, with mining, with other income producing activities um, in the crypto economy, it's important to differentiate between active and passive income. Uh, what I mean by that is in the previous example where I said that uh, you, know, you could lock up a, a certain portion of your holdings uh, in exchange for staking rewards or something like that, that's a very passive thing. That's that's akin to earning bank interest. You can also stake uh, through mining, essentially running a node, which is where you would actually be, uh, you know, responsible for the node validating transactions itself and and earning block rewards that way. That's a much more active form of investing, um, and that might have self employment tax implications. Um, at the very least, it's it's active income, not passive income, and it wouldn't necessarily be considered investment income. And then whenever we talk about active income, um, we're going to have a brief conversation about the issues around business and hobby losses, whether or not the uh, the the activity that you're involved in, be it staking or mining or, or operating nodes or anything like that, rises to the level of a, a bona fide business under tax code section 162. Um, a lot of them don't because a lot of this uh, things that that happen in the crypto sphere are, you know, although you're actively involved, it's not very time intensive. And there's things like material participation rules, which require certain hours be met and things like that. So it's it's a it's a much bigger conversation than we have time for today on this webinar, but it's something to keep in the back of your mind. And if anybody has questions about uh, hobby loss rules, you know, uh, clear a couple hours out of your calendar and feel free to give me a call. No, Phil, I appreciate you going into these pieces. I think I, when we were preparing for this, I think this was one of the slides that I think is going to be the most valuable because most people are getting their information or getting their advice from social media or influencers in this influencers in the space. And that's also, that can be good, but also could not be good. And this is one of, these are salient points of when it won't be good. If you apply broad strokes and you think you see something that may apply, um, you actually could be putting yourself in a very detrimental position if you don't have someone who's actually in the weeds, paying attention to this on a daily basis and has a unique understanding of both the crypto world 
as well as the traditional world of what possibly could apply. And that's what I was kind of taken away from this slide. So if you're listening to this and you're seeing this, this is a moneymaker slide right here um, just for being able to dive deeper and have a deeper understanding of what you could or couldn't be uh, putting yourself ex uh, in exposure to. So before I move on to the next slide, Sharon, was there anything you wanted to add on this one? Uh, yes, uh, I can add one thing, which is um, there's a difference uh, between earning staking reward versus uh, the activity of staking and unstaking. Uh, so uh, there's no official guidance at this point, but uh, staking itself, meaning that if you move some tokens to a staking protocol in order to earn reward, that part of the transaction is uh, usually not taxable. It's almost just like you are transferring something from one place to another place. Uh, also the same, unstaking is most likely also a non-taxable event, same, same as staking is a transfer of uh, your tokens or coins from that staking account back to your original wallet account. So those are not really stake, uh, I mean, taxable transactions. Uh, however, earning staking rewards usually uh, is always taxable. And I like that too, because especially with the Ethereum Shanghai upgrade, on the precipice of being released, you're starting. To, you're going to start to see an unstaking schedule where uh, people who did stake their Ethereum over the last however many years, I think it was a last couple, at least a year and a half to two years, where you could do it either through a staking service or through uh, operating your own node and being more active, um, you are now going to be able to unstake that ETH. And there's a lot of people concerned about what that is going to mean. So I think that's also a very important point to get across. Thank you, Sharon. No problem. So let's keep moving forward then on the last piece for crypto tax provision. And so uh, I know I get a lot of questions about NFTs, especially for those who have already been kind of going uh, into the space without any guidance and just going deep, deep dives and, and doing a lot of different things. So uh, Phil, I'd love for you to uh, sh shed some light and give us some intelligence on the NFT space when it comes to taxes. Yeah, sure. So the, the main question is, is what is an NFT? And at a very high level, it's the same as any other crypto. And at a very low detailed level, it's completely different. And what I mean by that is, you know, in general, the same rules apply to trading in NFTs as apply to trading in other cryptos. It's going to wind up on Form 8949. It's going to wind up on uh, Schedule D as a capital gain or loss. You buy something, you hold it for a period of time, then you sell it and you, you calculate the tax implications of that. Uh, where this all kind of gets a little murky is... is um, that a lot of the NFTs that are being traded right now are associated with, um, you know, art projects or, or something like that. Um, so most of them, you know, you hear the uh, the, the old huff and puff that, that, that why don't you just right click on the JPEG and download it and stuff like that. But that's the truth of the matter right now is that many of these NFTs are, are pictures. Um, and so there's an implication there that these might wind up being viewed as collectible. We don't know the answer to that yet. Um, Maybe, maybe not. We don't really have any sort of guidance, but at the very least, um, they are taxable along the lines of any other crypto that you trade. The implication with whether or not they are collectibles would be that they might be subject to higher tax rates for long-term capital gains. Uh, right now, obviously, individual investors fit into either the 15 or 20% tax rates on uh, long-term capital gains for collectible items, 28%. So it's a, a pretty substantial jump. Um, plus, you've got you know the, the the Medicare taxes and things like that on top of that, so it, it's a it's a sizable jump, and it's an area that we don't really know the answer to yet. Obviously, the most conservative approach um, is that anyone trading NFTs might want to consider putting these down as collectibles trades, um, but we don't see a lot of people doing that for for the obvious reasons, um, and also for the less obvious reasons that we don't really have any guidance yet. Um, where NFTs are going to start getting a, a little bit more uh, regulated is in the over $10,000 range. That's because uh, with the infrastructure bill, there's new KYC requirements to comply with Bank Secrecy Act requirements of uh, reporting transactions that are over $10,000. So it's it's good and bad, but the the basically what's happening here is that the uh, you know Congress is taking two separate stances. In, in one instance, they're saying that crypto is in no way affiliated with any sort of real money. 
And then so much as the Bank Secrecy Act may apply, they say that crypto is just cash. So, it, you know, they're really kind of contradicting themselves in the same bill. Um, and that kind of all got swept under the rug. But the, the long and short of it is that any sort of transaction that you partake in that's over $10,000 has to be reported now to the uh, Financial Crimes Enforcement Network um, on a Form 3800. Uh, you primarily as individual investors, you won't have to worry about that. That should be taken care of by the exchange uh, that you're trading through. But if you do any sort of peer-to-peer -peer things, it's something to watch out for in the future. This also falls kind of outside the definition of broker, which was, you know, broadly defined within the Infrastructure Act. So we don't know yet how peer-to-peer -peer transactions will kind of uh, get dragged into this or if they will at all, but that's kind of a wait and see right now. Uh, the other thing to think about with NFTs is that there might be sales tax implications. Um, this varies heavily depending on what state you live in, uh, where, where you're trading NFTs what type of NFT it is. By that, I mean what the what the token represents uh, because certain states have um, sales tax that applies to digital assets. Certain states have sales tax that apply only to tangible assets that you could see and touch and feel. Um, and then um, the other thing to remember is that certain states tax uh, membership dues. And so with a lot of these NFTs, you're not just buying the token, you're not just buying the picture, but you're also buying membership into a community it could be a Discord channel, a Twitter space, but there's you know you you see now that uh, board apes are having uh, uh, cocktail parties in Manhattan and things like that. So these are these are legitimate real world communities that you can only access through owning one of these NFTs. So the implication there is that it might be considered some sort of membership fees, which might be subject to sales tax at the state level. So again, that's another conversation that varies. You know, it, it, there's an incredible amount of variation depending on where you live. Uh, but if that's something that's of concern to you, we can definitely talk about that. Phil, I appreciate you diving in so much to to this space because I think this is where a lot of confusion is as well. Um, and even though we don't have clear guidance, I think the important thing is that this is why professionals such as yourselves uh, are very important to get in touch with early and often to at least start a planning process for different types of outcomes should something happen and to be prepared for whatever those outcomes for that's just you know diligent investing or diligent uh, ways of interacting with any type of space not just the crypto space uh, so if there's anything that's what i'm picking up here and i'd like to go back we actually had a question come in uh almost back to the staking and liquidity pool so the question came in from one of the attendees which was similar to staking but perhaps not as straightforward is liquidity pools which you did mention uh phil he heard another cpa recently mention that at the time of putting tokens into a liquidity pool, that contribution of funds is a taxable event like selling your tokens. Yep. Now they don't, and I guess, is that true? Or like, what's the answer to that? What's your response to that? Yeah, the conservative approach to that is that is that yes, what happens when you enter into a liquidity pool is you're giving two, generally speaking, it's, it's some ratio of two types of tokens into the liquidity pool in exchange for an LP token or a marker token. That's an exchange, right? You're giving up one Bitcoin and one ETH for one token that says that you owe me one Bitcoin and one ETH later. Uh, unfortunately, you know, it, 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 there's people who say that the LP token could function some, similar to like a note or an IOU, but in the digital asset space, the IRS has taken the stance that every time you trade one asset for another, it counts as a trade and it's taxable. So yes, contributing to an LP pool or a liquidity pool uh, is a taxable event as is coming out of one. Thank you for clarifying that. And I hope that answers your question. Um, and then uh, Tim brought in another question. Thank you, Tim, for being so active and uh, the other attendees for bringing in these questions, uh, asking about IRAs and Ross. And we're gonna get to that, Tim, I promise it's coming uh, here very, very shortly. So with that, I'd like to continue moving forward actually so we can get to that question is these other common strategies. Um, so I think Sharon, you were gonna take this one. You know, I mentioned at the beginning, we have these common strategies and concepts uh, from traditional finance that we can use as guidance in this new space. And so three of those I have on the screen here, but Sharon, I'd love for you to take control of this and, and walk us through. Yeah, sure. Um, so let's take a look at uh, wash sell rule first. So yes, so, um, Wash sale rules uh, are applicable at this point, uh, usually only to only for 
securities like stocks. Uh, cryptocurrency is considered property uh, based on uh, the IRS guidance. Therefore, uh, currently, crypto is not subject to wash sale rules yet, at least. But of course, there are provisions, um, I, I mean, regulations, proposed regulations, I should say, uh, in place that uh, they are trying to make crypto to be subject to wash sale rules as well. Uh, we, we don't know whether it's going to go through and become law, um, but at this time, it's not there yet. So therefore, we can still uh, sell crypto without having to worry about wash sale rules. Um, now, this is a very common strategy being used by many crypto investors. Uh, you probably can read on the internet, social media, especially near year end, a lot of the places, especially like crypto tax software companies, they were advertise saying that, hey, use our software to do your tax loss harvesting. Um, so one, one thing I do want to remind everybody, uh, crypto is not the only thing. Of course, some people, they do only invest in crypto alone, nothing else. But if you are an investor with other assets, not just crypto, such as stocks, mutual funds, or even real estate, other properties, um, you do need to consider everything together. Um, and this is a good time to say, if you have a financial advisor, definitely work with them. Or if you have a CPA, when you do your planning, uh, definitely um, work with the professionals because they can help you, guide you through this process a lot better than you just go ahead and do it. Uh, don't be blindsided and just focus on one thing only because there could be unknown consequences that you will have to face later. Uh, so you do need to consider every time when you try to adopt a strategy, look at the whole picture. And um, the reason you may want to utilize the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, not subject to watch sell rule for crypto to utilize the tax loss harvesting strategy is if you have some gains uh, either from crypto itself from earlier in the year or other investment properties uh, like stocks um, that has gains and you uh, want to generate some loss to offset those gains. Uh, people usually do this near year end because that's the time you can tell whether you uh, have a lot of gains that you need to utilize some losses to offset. Uh, if you do it sometime during the year, you never know what's going to happen. What if continuously you have more losses down the road and you would just like generate a lot of losses, which you may not be able to deduct. So I'm going to go over one of the pitfalls that we are going to talk about is um, the loss harvesting rule. So um, let's, uh, let, let's move on to the next, street, which is deducting crypto losses. Uh, so uh, usually people investing in crypto, uh, the loss uh, they will generate is capital loss because uh, they are investing. So crypto is an investment property to them. It's a capital asset for tax purposes. Uh, please keep in mind, again, crypto, I'm sorry, capital losses can only be used to offset or to deduct capital gains. Uh, of course, for individuals every year, you can also deduct up to $3,000 of net capital loss and use that to offset your other taxable income, including ordinary income. Uh, but other than that $3,000, uh, if you have capital loss, you can only use it to uh, offset your gain. So if you don't have any gains, all you can deduct is just $3,000. Uh, of course, you can carry forward the remaining loss uh, to future years. Now, there are different types of um, situations uh, that people want to know whether they can deduct a loss, such as uh, this happened actually, uh, unfortunately, uh, to several exchanges um, recently. Uh, that is, uh, people, they end up with coins stuck in an exchange that is going through bankruptcy. So the most famous case recently is FTX. Uh, and before that, Celsius. And uh, after that, F, um, BlockFi. So um, I, I feel the pain because I'm an investor too. I have funds stuck in, for example, BlockFi. Now, can you deduct your crypto that is stuck in an exchange that is going through bankruptcy? 
Uh, well, the, re the, the answer is unfortunately not yet. Uh, before the bankruptcy uh, is finalized, you cannot really take a deduction because you still have an ownership to those coins and there's no way to tell what will come out at the end of the bankruptcy because uh, in many cases, you will be able to get compensated. Um, so just be careful. Don't just go ahead and take the loss right away. Uh, and then the other loss deduction scenario is what if your crypto declined in value, almost like went to zero? Can you take the deduction? About two months ago, the RS issued a memorandum. It's um, number uh, 2023-02011. Uh, that talks about uh, this exact situation. So some someone tried to claim a worthless uh, property deduction or, or capital, gain, capital loss deduction or abandonment loss deduction. And the memo says very clearly, uh, that is not allowed because that individual still owns the crypto and that crypto is still, even though the value is now so low, still being traded on exchanges. In that case, you cannot take a loss deduction. Uh, another common scenario is that people uh, got their coins stolen or hacked or scammed. Someone sent them an email, hey, this is a great opportunity, send me your coin, I will give you this blah, blah, blah. And then they fell for it. They send the coin to them and never heard them from them again. In this scenario, it's actually considered personal casualty loss. Unfortunately, under the current tax law, it's not deductible. Now, one last uh, scenario is a uh, loss deduction, uh, whether you can take it if you, unfortunately, um, are in a rug pull situation, like you send some coin for ICOs, or uh, you are using the exchange, but and then it suddenly got shut down like uh, two years ago, I think, like Cryptopia and some other famous shutdown, um, whether you can take that. So now the current uh, tax law is not clear. There's no official guidance about this situation. Some people argue that uh, you can take an investment capital loss deduction because that's not your fault. You have no control. And indeed, you put in the investment. Uh, so therefore, it failed and you lost your money, you should be able to take a deduction. So it really depends on how much risk or how you know conservative or aggressive you want to be. Uh, I would recommend that you talk to your CPA about the situation. All right, the next one is, um, I believe it's the IRA. Yes, uh, so that's related to the question. Uh, now, uh, it's becoming more and more popular, and including myself, uh, okay, uh, people are using IRAs to invest in crypto. Now, you do need to make sure you consider all the pros and cons, because uh, as you know, cryptocurrency investment is very risky. It's highly risky, volatile. So whether you want to use this for your retirement saving, that's a decision you should make carefully. And here, I would advise you to consult your financial advisor. Uh, and you also have to look at your whole investment strategy, both uh, uh, non-taxable, meaning that the retirement plan versus your taxable uh, investment accounts. Uh, there are usually three types of IRAs people uh, consider, will consider by uh, doing crypto investment, traditional Roth and non-deductible. Each has its own tax treatment. Uh, so be careful. Uh, I My personal IRA, that I'm using to invest in crypto is the Roth IRA because uh, as you know, uh, Roth IRA is not deductible for contribution. However, uh, qualified distribution uh, is also not taxable at all. So I can have my crypto grow in that account. And when I take it out, when I retire, none of that is taxable. Uh, but everybody's situation is different. So consult your financial advisors and your CPAs. Uh, another thing I want to mention also is that there are two common types uh, of uh, entity types that people are using to own their IRA for investing in crypto. One is uh, the so-called checkbook LLC, um, and the other type is the investment trust. Uh, LLC, uh, you do have to worry about, like, uh, it has to be registered as a regular LLC first, so it's subject to state law. For example, in California, you have to pay a $100 annual LLC fee, um, so that is a cost you need to consider. While investment trust is set up at the federal level, it's not subject to any state law. Uh, here, you need to make sure that you uh, consult uh, qualified professionals uh, to guide you through this if you are not sure which one you should take. 
Uh, also, you have to choose a custodian. Even though it's self-directed IRA, you can do your crypto investment uh, on your own. You don't need uh, a professional. If you want to do it on your own, it's fine. However, you still, just like a regular IRA account, you still need a custodial. So there are certain companies out there that they do uh, manage uh, crypto-related IRAs for you. So you have to sign up with one of them. Um, and one last thing is, this is actually the question about um, unrelated business income. So be mindful, uh, just same as for regular IRA. Uh, it doesn't matter that you are doing a self-directed IRA and investing in crypto. All the rules are exactly the same as having a regular uh, IRA account. Uh, you cannot use uh, any funds in the IRA to do uh, anything that will create unrelated business income uh, for activities that are considered usually like business activities. So be mindful if you use, for example, if you set up a mining facility and use your money in the IRA to invest, to fund that activity, potentially this could be considered a unrelated business and maybe you may be subject to this unrelated business taxable income. Um, so I think that's all so, for me. So we had a question that came in on this. And so specifically asking what in what type of cases actually would a qualified account where a qualified account like an IRA or, or a Roth IRA investing in crypto could cause a reportable transaction. Um, and I think you just mentioned that one. So mining, using it for funding operations. Are there right. any other cases or any other scenarios that may trigger that? Uh, yeah, so anything that is considered like not allowed. So there are specific rules regarding what type of investments you can have by using an IRA, a retirement account. Um, if you are not sure, again, uh, I would recommend that you consult your financial advisor uh, because there are many different scenarios. And sometimes you have to look into the specific uh, uh, situation. Uh, but again, the uh, in general, you need to follow all the rules that set up saying that, okay, these are the allowed uh, transaction types or activity types. And if it's outside of that list, I would recommend not to do it. Sharon, thank you so much for going through a lot of these common strategies. And yes, uh, many times throughout, it's consult your financial advisor as well, um, which is, yes, uh, that's why we exist today is uh, as much as uh, we think that we can broad stroke a lot of these common strategies, there is a lot more nuance. And there are so many things and so many ways where you can trip or trigger certain things that may put you in a detrimental situation, which is where why the value for you know financial advisors such as us who do understand these things, who and then also have strategic partners such as uh, Polygon with you and Phil and the team over at Polygon uh, to help us navigate and communicate with each other in a cohesive manner, I think is very, very important for everyone in this space. Um, so I appreciate you going through all of that. So I'd like to run us through the last section of the uh, of the of the presentation here, which is the crypto tax pitfalls. So everyone, here's the magic, and these are real scenarios and real things that are happening right now that we see people falling into. And this is a wide range from your basic investor investing small amounts of money to your very very sophisticated investors, or what we would traditionally call sophisticated investors, with very large amounts of money. Um, they're making a lot of the same mistakes or falling into some of these pitfalls. So I'd love for Phil and Sharon, I don't know who's going to take the first one, um, but I'd love for you to take for this first pitfall too, which is tax loss harvesting as a magic bullet. Yes, uh, I can talk about that. So many people thought uh, tax loss harvesting is the way to go, especially like uh, I mentioned earlier, many uh, software companies, they promote us uh, near year end, uh, but you need to be careful because it's not for everybody. Well, first again, crypto losses can only be used to offset capital gains. If you don't have a large amount of capital gains, there's no reason you want to generate a large amount of capital losses. Now also, um, once you sell, you if you even if you can buy it back because you don't need to worry about the wash sale rule, you lose the holding period. That means um, next year when the market is much better, you want to sell it for a gain, then chances are you now are going to be subject to a short-term capital gain. Rather than if you continue to hold, then you will uh, have a long-term capital gain, which is subject to a lower tax rate. 
So that is something you have to be, be careful about. Uh, also, another thing is uh, don't just go ahead and sell because the market now is so much lower because especially if you have been uh, buying uh, throughout the years, you don't even know what you would end up uh, because you could have uh, some tax lots that uh, you bought a long time ago having a low cost basis. And now when you sell, compared to last year, maybe now the price has dropped so much, but compared to two years ago, three years ago, it's still higher than you actually could end up with again. So uh, in order to uh, decide whether you want to take a loss harvesting, you have to know your cost basis. So the, the, the way to, to uh, do that is you will need to use a crypto tax software to uh, reconcile all your accounts and have an ongoing um, cost basis tracking to know exactly whether uh, you want to sell. I mean, if you sell a certain coin, whether it's going to give you a gain or a loss. I really appreciate you diving this as the first pitfall because this is one of the main pitfalls we see as practicing financial advisors. And one of the ones we're very concerned about um, because I think there's this... Uh, uh, notion in everyone's mind is that, oh, this must be the same level of quality of service and platform and dashboard as when I use my Schwab account or when I use my TDA account, I get the same exact thing, right? And when there, when they go buy a stock or if you go to Robinhood or Webull or even when these newer investment platforms, people just assume that they're going to get the same things done and don't realize the work that they have to do themselves. And this is the first spot where we see most people, which is not tracking closely cost basis. And especially for investors who started four or five, six years ago and who are actively been, been in the space and trading cross-chain and trading so many different tokens over so many years, period of time, it's impossible. And all of a sudden now they need a lot of help and they have no idea where to start or how to compile everything. Even though we do have tax software solutions, it's a lot of work. And sometimes you have clients and we've seen um, millions of transactions and it's it's just a mess. And so that's where, again, having a trusted resource to help you if you're going to do, go out into the world and do things, making sure that they keep you aware is so vital in this space, even more so because all of the same things don't exist in the in this world that they do in the traditional world. Um, so yeah, I really appreciate that one. That that hits home very quickly. Um, so uh, Phil, Sharon, who, who wants to go into the next yeah, football? I'm gonna I'm going to talk about this as well, and then I'm going to let you and Phil talk uh, about the next one. So this pick four is many people still believe that uh, if they don't, if they have a loss, they don't need to report their crypto transactions. So this year, we noticed a significant decrease in uh, people coming uh, for help uh, regarding their crypto tax calculation, because as you know, 2022 was a pretty bad year for crypto, unfortunately. So many people suffer a loss uh, overall. Uh, so they believe that, oh, since I have a loss, I don't need to report because there's no taxable income. Uh, I, I will not need to worry about subject to uh, tax, right? Uh, however, keep in mind that as Phil mentioned earlier, every crypto trade is a taxable event is a reportable event. You need to report it on your tax uh, tax return. So except for purchase with uh, fiat, uh, of course, but crypto for crypto or crypto for fiat trades are all taxable events. It doesn't matter whether it's a gain or a loss. Now, the second thing is, if you don't report, you don't show your calculation, there's no way that you can prove indeed you have a loss. So the IRS is going to come after you, especially if they receive any information from exchanges that they know you have been trading in crypto and they don't see your uh, crypto uh, transaction being reported on your return, they very likely will go, go after you because they don't know whether you have a gain or loss. They want money from you. Uh, also, <laughs> if you have losses, why not reporting them and claim a deduction against your gains or even the even the three thousand dollars of net loss deduction you can use to uh, offset your ordinary income so that's a benefit to you so why not utilize this benefit um, so again the last point is uh, not reporting crypto transactions it doesn't matter gain or loss uh, it will very likely get you into trouble with the IRS and also uh, state tax authorities uh, so our advice is don't just ignore your crypto reporting obligation 
because you have a loss. That's um, not a good decision to make. <laughs> uh, we would wholeheartedly agree there. Um, and actually, uh, I'd love to continue this with, we did have a question come in regarding in terms of uh, losses is our, and I think you answered this a little bit, but maybe we can be more direct. Is our, this comes from Russell. Thank you, Russell, for the question. Is our fraud slash Ponzi losses filed as a capital loss? Is there any way that it can be used to offset income instead of capital losses? So that situation is a little bit tricky because there are specific rules regarding uh, people in a fraud or Ponzi scheme scenario. In the past, uh, it was a, uh, it, it could be reported on itemized deduction schedule A, but then now uh, under the current um, tax law is no longer allowed. However, I think if you have, uh, like you reported to the police um, and it's being, uh, the, the fraudster is being prosecuted and it's just a, a, a case filed against them and you can substantiate your loss, you have all the proof, things like that, potentially you can still uh, claim a loss deduction, but this is a tax return related question. So Phil is more um, knowledgeable than me in answering this. So Phil, you want to chime in here? Yeah, sure. Um, you're, you're right, Sharon. Ponzi, the term Ponzi scheme um, has a very specific meaning when we talk about it in terms of the tax code. Um, and, and a lot of that was written about, you know, uh, during the, the Madoff years, um, you know, when that all went to uh, hell in a handbasket. Uh, but generally speaking, um, the, the Ponzi losses are going to count as ordinary losses. Whether or not you can deduct those uh, depends on whether it's a bona fide Ponzi scheme or not. And the trouble that you're going to have specifically in the crypto space at this point in time is that most of the protocols and platforms that failed last year are now under bankruptcy proceedings, which kind of trumps the whole issue of whether or not it was a Ponzi. So for people involved in, you know, uh, BlockFi and Celsius and things like that, that are that are actively being adjudicated through bankruptcy court it's a wait and see right now the entire tax code is premised on this idea of realization events things have to actually happen in order for you to claim them as income or deduction um, and while there's an outstanding bankruptcy uh, uh hearing in progress nothing has really happened yet we still don't know how the chips are going to fall you may get some of your money back you may get you know all of it you may get pennies on the dollar. Um, and, you know, it might happen soon or it might happen five years from now. Um, but as you know, with with what's going on right now or what happened in 2022 uh, in the crypto space, most of it is a wait and see right now. We're advising everybody who had exposure to one of the, the failed platforms um, to go ahead and extend in the hopes that there may be some guidance issued specifically for uh, crypto related failures that, that occurred last year. But that's, you know, we're, we're holding our breath on that. I'm not mm -hmm. certain that anything's going to come before October. Thank you so much for answering that that question from, from Russell. And Chris, I see your last question here, and that'll dovetail nicely into kind of our last piece here. And we'll end off with your question, which is more of a high-level general one. Um, so the last bit I'd like to go over is more kind of in our realm. Uh, and Phil and I had spent a lot of time talking about this prior to this uh, webinar. Um, and this is more of a ad financial advisor centric pitfall that we see um, over at Arbor. And those are not planning for the four core investment decisions. You know, we we have such a robust experience at our firm and, our, and we have a team that you know has been in the, the industry for decades. And so when we get these newer investors or we even get tradition seasoned investors who are engaging with this new space, we start to see some of the things that um, we think about being completely forgotten about. And the number one thing is here is everyone is only thinking about entering the markets. They're only thinking about buying and that's it. And so what we like to bring to the table as financial advisors and especially as investment advisors through our SMA platform is we have a plan for those four core decisions that we've now used in our experience to bring it to this space. And those are the following. That is, what's your total overall allocation in your wealth picture that you can afford to. And we take a risk-based approach to finding that number out. The second decision we have to make is the actual sizing as an investor. So in our SMAs, we have a robust process for how do we pick and choose the sizing of if you're doing a multi-asset or multi-coin or multi-token uh, investment. Um, so a lot of people don't even think about how do I size this? They just think I'll put a, a random dollar amount and it's just random. 
And we kind of try to take that and so we try to replace randomness with a disciplined process. So then it comes down, then you can decide your entry. Okay, now that I've got these first two decisions, we can decide how are we gonna enter the markets? And again, we have a much more detailed process rather than just a random one of if the markets are up or down. Um, and then your last decision, which needs to be planned out prior to entering is your exit. What is the criteria? What are, you, what are your goals? What is the reason for investing? Um, it is so incredibly important to have this in mind prior to actually doing anything and taking action. Um, and this stuff tells me into a couple of scenarios, real life scenarios with clients from advisor friends of mine who work at some of the biggest firms in the industry. Um, one is at Merrill Lynch and one is at Charles Schwab. They know I'm in the space. And so they call me for a lot of their crypto needs because they can't serve them right now. And these are sophisticated investors that are putting multi-millions of dollars into the space who were doing things without these decisions in mind and are now all of a sudden facing huge tax bills, talking millions of dollars in tax bills that they have no idea how to pay now. And now the financial advisor is scrambling because the investor did not share with their advisor that they were doing these things. And the advisor themselves, unbeknownst to them, couldn't holistically service their client. So we've already had to come in and help service those clients who are falling into this huge pitfall. And I would say, Phil, you and I were talking about that. We talked about kind of this patchwork approach to financial advisor and investing in different spaces. Are you guys seeing similar scenarios play out at, at Polygon? Yeah, absolutely. Um, although not necessarily for 2022. Um, most people in, in the crypto space, myself included, lost our shirts uh, last year. <laughs> but 2021 and, and hopefully, um, uh, you know, uh, 2023, whatever the next bull run starts, and we start to see some of these big gains accumulating again, um, we'll certainly see it again. There, there's long been a myth in, in the crypto economy that you don't need to report anything, you don't need to pay taxes until you cash out, until you come out to fiat. That's wrong. That's totally wrong. Uh, but unfortunately, that myth has been so pervasive that people make a bunch of crypto on a trade and then immediately reinvest that crypto into other other avenues and things like that. And so nobody's you know stopping along the way to calculate their gains and figure out what their tax bill should be. Um, the way I always say it is, you know, pay the IRS before you buy a boat because you don't want to you don't want to be stuck on your boat uh, with with an installment agreement um, come come summertime. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, beyond that, it, it's taxes are, are one piece of the puzzle and, and, you know, qualified, competent financial advice is, is the other piece of the puzzle. And that's the hard part right now, because so few financial advisors are advising on th this crypto piece, because, you know, there, there's regulations, things like that, that maybe they're not able to do it at, at this time, but it's really, um, finding people who work with you as a whole, holistically as, as a whole investor, you know, you've got your stocks and bonds, you've got your crypto, you've got your real estate, you've got whatever else you have. Um, as, as tax professionals, you know, the expression is that our clients undress in front of us. We see everything that you do because we have to, because it all winds up on the tax return. Um, but if you are kind of getting uh, patchwork financial advice or, or piecemeal financial advice from two or three or four different advisors, you can really run into problems because of the interplay between all the various types of investments you have. Phil, I appreciate you piggybacking off that. And I, I, it's so important what you just said and what you, what Sharon, what you've gone through. And we are at the end of this webinar. And I'd like to end this off with Chris's question, which is generally speaking, what are some of the major challenges that accounting firms are facing when scaling their portfolio or Web3 slash cryptocurrency clients into 2023? So that's a big question, but try to narrow it down as much as you guys can. Uh, well, for me, I would say that uh, is uh, the the biggest challenges is really to uh, help our clients when they uh, they don't know how much they owe and because they have never done their reconciliation before, and uh, to make them understand, you know, just like Phil said, uh, there are plannings that we need to do actually beforehand because that's why it's called planning uh when everything is already done uh it's a little bit too late 
Uh, and that's exactly what, where we, we are right now. Um, and also understanding all the compliance uh, requirements, uh, such as what I mentioned about uh, having losses, no need to report uh, or um, no need to report unless you uh, cash out all those things. It's uh, to educate our clients. Uh, also, uh, technology is another big uh, challenge that uh, people got into complicated transactions like yield farming, DeFi, liquidity pools, all those things. Uh, currently, uh, software companies are still trying to catch up on all uh, on technologies features to be able to handle all those complicated transactions. So those are two uh, a few uh, examples I can think of at this point. Uh, Phil, do you have anything to add? Yeah, just just the uncertainty. Um, you know, we're we're advising on things uh, on the basis of general tax principles that may or may not turn out to be true um, in in the future. You know, it, it's all it's all up in you know we we've kind of pinned our hopes on Congress, um, which is a, a a tough position to be in because we're 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 hoping that they'll in general abide by the the basic structure of the tax code, but they may not. Um, and then beyond that, just the, the you know, when we're talking about scaling, it's it's this similar arrangement of, of all accounting firms, which is, you know, a, a talent shortage and things like that. But specifically, as it applies to a company who does what we do, um, is that, you know, the accounting profession is very hidebound. It's very, uh, it's it's very old school. It's, you know, it's, it's leather books and and ties tied up tight and, and pocket protectors and things like that. And there's not a whole lot of people who are willing to kind of, uh, you know, jump out into the ether and and um, advise on things like this. So that's been a difficulty for us. But, but you know, as, as the space grows, as uh, the crypto economy grows, as it becomes more entrenched in, in everyday life and society, I think, you know, kind of the sea change is here. Um, and it's clear that I was wrong five years ago. Crypto is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, it's it's going to be a part of all of our lives for for a long time coming. So we're kind of starting to see that change um, mm -hmm. at the at the accounting firm level. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of it's just the uncertainty. Very well said, Phil, Sharon. Thank you for that. And I guess I'll end off with uh, in in uncertainty. I think this only calls for even more reason to do planning and to do things before, like you said, before the action's done. We need to do the planning. That's why it's called planning. So I actually get excited, even though there's a lot of uncertainty, it actually makes what we do so much more important. If we have the full clarity, it'd be much easier, but because it's so difficult, and I, I know us as professionals, I get confused even following this on a day-to-day -day hourly basis. I can only imagine the general investor or and not even just the investor. I think we, you know, we've done a good job in separating. There's not just investors, there's the users. These are the people in the crypto economy that are building it, that are making the infrastructure uh, that you know we are all in, you know, as uh, just investors, uh, some of us are. Um, so it's important to give them the guidance um, that they need and help them get some semblance of certainty in an uncertain space. Um, so I get excited about being able to add that value. I know you guys too. Um, so with that, we are at the end of our webinar. I appreciate every one of you for joining and answering and asking uh, questions. We are going to compile these questions and compile a lot of this information and intelligence and send out to everyone who's registered. Um, so don't worry, we'll make sure you that gets to you. But if you would like to talk to somebody, even if it's just to get a pair of eyes uh, on it, you will need to reach out to either Sharon or Phil. You can see their emails here on the screen. It's Sharon at Polygon Advisory or Phil at Polygon Advisory. And for us, we have a ton of ways that you can get in touch with us at arborddigital.io. And I know Polygon, especially on their website, a ton of resources, especially when it comes to crypto taxes. Uh, again, you are going to get this decked because you will also get um, our social medias all down at the bottom where we're posting regular updates, future events, wink, wink. There may be some future events Arbor and Polygon partner on in the, to, to keep bringing value to, to you all and to every one of our clients. Um, but with that being said, uh, thank you, everyone, again, for joining us today. Uh, Sharon, Phil. Very much appreciate you. You guys are such important people to have in this space. And I know you guys are stewarding your clients in a, in a wonderful way. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us, Mark. Everybody, thank you so much for joining. And we'll see you next time. Have a great day. Bye.